there's a lot of similarities, I think, between your personal philosophy and Jordan Peterson's. I know you've spoken to him a couple of times. What have you learned from him? Well, the, the most interesting thing that I learned from Jordan Peterson, and I mentioned this the first time he came on my podcast, was that you know he's a trained academic that studied this stuff his whole life, and we came to a lot of the same conclusions about things. And I just came to those conclusions through living and the, the experiences that I had, and he came to them through studying this stuff in a very rigorous way. And, and the cool thing is, luckily for me, I had written books that sort of predated. Uh, I got there first. Yeah. I got there first. It wasn't that I got there first, but I mean, I, this, these were the thoughts that I had. I mean, Discipline Equals Freedom. That book came out, I think, before, I, before Jordan Peterson was on the scene. It's the book Extreme Ownership, which is about taking personal responsibility. Well, it's about taking responsibility, and you can definitely apply it to personal responsibility. So luckily for me, those, those books kind of predated uh, Jordan Peterson coming onto the scene and and doing everything that he did but again it's not like i created any of those things it's not like i created it before he created it and it's not like he created it before other philosophers had figured these things out so i'd say that the most interesting thing about jordan peterson that i that i found and i think it was pretty interesting to him too was the fact that we both had kind of come to these same conclusions and we had lived very different lives i mean I'm sure there's m more disparate lives that we could live, but they're, they're pretty different lives. And that's, that was a very interesting thing. And it, it made me feel like, well, it made me feel good about the fact that the things that I had figured out were in line with things that he had figured out. And that means maybe there's a little bit more strength and universality to these things that I believed, which, which felt pretty good. I was going to pause that. Do you want to go and see if there's someone stealing things outside? <laughs> If there's someone stealing things, can you let me know? It looks like they're bringing things in. That's the opposite. It's nice to know or to think that something that's been proven in the field of battle or on the field of play is backed up in academia, right? That someone can go through the annals of philosophy history and come to a similar conclusion as you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And... You know, the stuff, the stuff that I say is in the Bible, the stuff that I say is in Stoicism. And, and Jordan Peterson, you know, says the stuff that I say or I say the stuff that he says. Again, I'm not trying to compete with Jordan Peterson on any level, uh, especially some kind of an intellectual level. But we have similar thoughts about things and that predated either one of us knowing who each other were. So I think that's pretty cool. Why do you think people are drawn to advice that's telling them to do hard things? Kind of seems counterintuitive. Why do I think people are drawn to advice telling them to do hard things? Because I think pe any person, any human realizes that if you want some kind of a good outcome, you're going to have to work hard for it. And if you, and if you don't work hard for something, you're not going to get an outcome that's really worth much. Well, that is the thing that separates the achievements on the other side of it, right? If it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, everyone would achieve it. So th this is one of the things that I, I try and rely on when training's been getting hard. So I ruptured my Achilles a couple of years ago. That sucked. I wouldn't advise it as, a, as an injury generally. Yeah, and it's like a random... You'd a lot of times of people nowhere. just do it, you know, getting out of their car or Dude, something. I was playing cricket. Yeah, the most British go. way to snap an That's Achilles. That's a very British way to snap your Achilles for sure. Um, <laughs> during that, during the rehab for that, it's pretty just uncomfortable. It's endless calf raises, right? Which is not fun. And the discomfort that you feel and the, the, pain, the um, fear of it re-rupturing, which is the number one thing you don't want it to, to have happen, the thing that I went back to in my mind was, this is why I'm here. The discomfort that I was feeling, the um, effort, the pain, the sweat. Thankfully, this was during COVID, so it meant that if I had to do a workout every single morning for half an hour on just my calves, it's like, what else are you doing, right? There's a pandemic going on. Um, this is why you're here, was the reminder. It's like, look, this is the reason why the re-rupture rate is uh, 5 to 10%, because people don't want to do this thing. People don't want to do the thing because it hurts, because it takes half an hour every single day for nearly 12 months. It's a full 12-month recovery. That's why.
this is why you're here. And I think that you're right. I think that the selection is people deep down know that picking up heavy things physically, psychologically, existentially, culturally is good for us. And I think that that's why it's attractive. I agree. Another thing that I think is that it's one of the reasons why people can become a little bit triggered, triggered. They can become a little bit uncomfortable when they see somebody else that's got a lot of discipline. Because I think deep down they know that if they had that thing, that that would fix a lot of the problems that they have in their life. Is this, is this a dynamic that, you, that you've seen? I'm sure that's a, a bummer for someone to look at someone else that's working really hard and and achieving some positive things and they know that they're not maybe working as hard as they could be and they're not really achieving what they want to achieve. I'm sure that stings a little bit. Another thing that Jordan said recently is that the problem with Twitter is that the price of being a prick has fallen to zero. I feel like you'd agree with that as well. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'd agree with that. If you're going to spend a bunch of time on Twitter, you're going you're gonna to run into a bunch of people that don't like you and they're going to say it and there's nothing you can do about it. So, <laughs> And the ability for people's words and the consequences of those words to become detached as well is something that's only pretty recent. I mean, I mean, I guess you could have sent a mean telegram a hundred years ago. Yeah. I, I, I would recommend that you don't let random bots or people on Twitter bother you that much. That's, that's my recommendation. I, I would recommend you. To, I, you know, the first time I kind of experienced that, it was when I was on, I was on Rogan for the first time and the, YouTube video came out and I sat there with my oldest daughter who was probably maybe 14 or 15 at the time. And I sat there and read these <laughs> heinous comments about me and laughed. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of, you know, some of them were pretty good. It was kind of funny. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not getting bothered by somebody that wants to talk smack about me for whatever on Twitter. And also there's, there's probably some truth to whatever they're saying. You know, they say I'm a big knuckle dragger. Yeah, probably right. <laughs> you know, they say I'm an idiot. Yeah, there's definitely some of that. What else? <laughs> What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.